gender roles and responsibilities are very different than mainstream roles and responsibilities. We never had those kind of Western ideas of what a lady should be like. In my culture, Navajo culture, the women were in charge of everything. They have power. They were the change makers. For American Indian women, before voting rights could be won, citizenship had to be secured. And this was one of the major causes of civil rights leader, author, and composer, Gertrude Simmons Bonin, also known as Zip Kala Shaw. Gertrude Simmons Bonin was born in 1876 on the Yankton Reservation in South Dakota to the Ihantawan tribe. She later renamed herself Zip Kala Shaw, meaning red bird in the Lakota language. I don't think anything is known about her father except that he was a non-Indian, but her mother raised her up as an Indian girl, and she saw herself as an Indian. I was a wild little girl with a pair of soft moccasins on my feet, as free as the wind that blew my hair, and no less spirited than a bounding deer. The Yankton Sioux made a treaty with the United States in the mid-1850s. They made peace early on, and they were not caught up in the major conflicts that the other Sioux tribes had with the United States. There were 60 million American Indians in 1491. In the census in 1910, there were 200,000. For the colonizers who were greedy for Indian lands, there were two ways to get it, either by killing people or by making them non-Indians. In 1884, at age eight, like tens of thousands of other American Indian children, Zid Kala Shaw left the reservation to attend a boarding school run by missionaries in Indiana. The boarding school system was an institutional way of trying to erase tribal identity. You had children from all these different tribes thrown in together, made to wear uniforms, lose their individual identity, forbidden to speak their native languages, forced to become Christians. Like a slender tree, I had been uprooted from my mother, nature, and God. I was shorn of my branches. Now a cold, bare pole, I seem to be planted in a strange earth, trembling with fear and distrust. Often I wept in secret. Zid Kala Shah went on to attend Earl College in Indiana and later the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. She was musically gifted. She performed at the White House for President McKinley. People were fascinated with her because she was a performer, because she was articulate. In 1897, she became a teacher at the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, the first federally funded boarding school for American Indian youth founded by military officer Richard Henry Pratt. The idea that Richard Pratt had was to kill the Indian to save the man. The way you look, the way you dress, the way you think, the way you talk, the way you pray, they had to cut that out, save the soul inside. It's tragic, really. Native people weren't even viewed as human beings at this time. After disagreements with Pratt, Zip Kala Shaw left her job at Carlisle, and in 1900, published several exposés about the trauma of the boarding school experience in the Atlantic Monthly. Gazing upon the Indian girls and boys bending over their books, the white visitors walked out of the schoolhouse well satisfied. They were educating the children of the red man. But few have paused to question whether real life or long-lasting death lies beneath this semblance of civilization. The stories are published, and the criticisms are that she bites the hands that fed her, that she's criticizing the boarding school education, which educated her to write the stories. In 1901, Zip Shaw also published a book of short stories based on the Sioux oral tradition. I have tried to transplant the native spirit of these tales into the English language since America in the last few centuries has acquired a new tongue. She 
works very hard to make the disparate parts of her life fit together. But she also sees herself as being a preserver of those stories. In 1902, Zit Kalashaw married Raymond Bonin, another boarding school survivor from her tribe. They lived for 14 years among the Ute Nation on the Uinta and Ure Reservation in Utah, raising their son and working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There, in 1913, Zit Kalashaw wrote the first American Indian opera in collaboration with white composer William Henson. The Sundance Opera was inspired by a sacred ceremony of spiritual healing then outlawed by the U.S. government. The Sundance is common among the tribes on the plains, and it is a dance of personal devotion and sacrifice. She is resisting the denial of religious ritual and trying to elevate these tribal sacred dances and songs to what she knows is respected in Western society which is Grand Opera. The opera was staged across Utah 15 times by a cast of American Indians and white performers. The opera gave space to perform sacred dances and songs. In a public setting, it preserved those songs. As she witnessed the quality of life on Indian reservations decline, Zit Kalashaw moved to Washington, D.C. in 1916 to dedicate the rest of her life to political activism. Indians are virtually prisoners of war in America. Treaties with our government are still unfulfilled. There is no doubt about the direction in which I wish to go, to spend my energies in working for the Indian race. As Secretary of the Society of American Indians, the first civil rights organization created by and for American Indians, she edited its journal and served as a lobbyist in Congress. She gives public speeches, she writes editorials, and one of her major causes was to help get citizenship for American Indians. Now the time is at hand when the American Indian shall have his day in court and find his rightful place in our American life. Wardship is no substitute for citizenship. Therefore, we seek enfranchisement. Zip Kalashaw's work was significant to the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, which granted U.S. citizenship to American Indians. Zip Kalashaw understood that there's these two worlds that you have to be a part of, and you want to have power in both of them. In 1926, she and her husband founded the National Council of American Indians to continue advocating for American Indians' rights and representation. She served as its president until her death 12 years later. She firmly believed that the answer to Indian issues lay in Indian people themselves. Indians are still fighting for their rights. The theft of Indian land, missing and murdered indigenous women, voters' rights, and that's where her voice is important. The American Indian must have a voice. Let us teach our children to be proud of their Indian blood. Let us stand up straight and continue claiming our human rights. Mm.